Hello everyone and welcome to our advanced deck building guide for Android Netrunner. If you haven't seen the basic deck building guide and you're just starting out with Netrunner, that is definitely the place to go as the name might entail. Unless you're like me and you want to skip right <laughs> Just ahead. Jump right in. Uh, so you can dive over to that. We've got all of this stuff condensed on a nice blog series. So you can check that out in the links below. We'll probably throw some cards up. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll find a way to get you there because that's really the best way to be consuming these videos and everything else that we have to offer for Netrunner. So Zach, I got a, I got a confession to make. All right. I started planning uh, this video uh, <laughs> for uh, a couple of days. Yep. Uh, a couple of days ago. You really want to frame it out? What concepts had, you want to cover? I started, what we want to talk about? I started putting the outline together and, and really you know, trying to hone in on all the important things you need to know to be a great deck builder and Android net owner. Something tells me you ran into a problem. Well, I realized the video is going to be like seven hours long. Uh, so I scrapped that plan because there's just so much information. I scrapped that plan and I instead I, I took a little uh, notebook uh, piece of paper. You do piece that. You of tear them out, paper. but it looks like you. They're not mad supposed... scientists, you know. Like well, I, I simply what I said was if I had a new player who was familiar with the game and I could give them advice on what they should do. What in would terms be the most building, important advice you could give them? What would be the most. So I started scrolling it out. I, I you know. Marked out some stuff and did some things. Well, and so that's what this video is going to be. I okay. think that's going to be the most helpful thing to get across. It's a lot of tips. It's a lot of kind of ways of digesting the decisions that you're going to make. It's not so much about here are the decisions you should be making, sure. but here are the tools you need to make the right decisions. To make the decision. And, you know, I mean, part of what makes Netrunner and games like Netrunner so great is the depth that they offer. So right. like you were saying, I mean, there's tens upon tens of hours, if not more, that you could convey information wise to someone who's looking to kind of step up their deck building but these are the these are the these are the things that came to mind and be be uh, you know know that there are a number of other great resources out there for this kind of stuff uh, we have all of those collected on the blog series as well so if you want i mean you can dive so deep into this and read articles until for days. probably tomorrow uh, and still still not fully appreciate everything that's happening in the game uh, so let's kick it off. I'm going to start with the runner. I'm going to focus a lot on the runner in this video, uh, primarily because the runner has to be ready for everything, whereas the corp is a piece of that everything. It's right? usually just, you know, it takes a certain route, and mm -hmm. the runner is going to have to deal with that decision making. I think of the runner as the, you have to be able to solve any puzzle. And the corp is just one of a thousand possible puzzles. Sure. So it's more direct and like, I'm going to throw this challenge at the runner, but the runner needs to be ready for everything. So we've talked about this before in the basic deck building, but uh, I think of it as a, a few different elements make a great runner deck. So first is economy. That includes both money and cards. And there's some ideas there how they work together. Uh, breaking ice or more specifically overcoming ice in some way, getting through ice. You can do that in a vast number of ways. Some of them don't involve icebreakers at sure. all. Uh, and there are some, some wild decks changing ice to certain types. There's that surfer card, oh, so fun, so cool. You can surf around. You can uh, try to play a game where you're only using cards like blackmail, which I think is no longer in the game, but just stuff that like avoids the need to break ice to begin with. So that's always that you can deny the corp money, whatever it is that you're gonna do to get through ice and get into servers. Uh, and then you have, what are you gonna do whenever you get into a server? Sure. There needs to be cards that basically punish the corp for letting you in. So most of the time it's gonna be on central servers, R&D and HQ. Uh, so if you're able to get into those, you need to do more than just access a single card most of the time. Uh, and then there's also, what do I do if there's a remote open? What do I do if there's a lot of uh, remote servers being established? Do I have a way to punish the corporation for leaving all these servers unprotected? So there, that's kind of the shtick of your deck, what you're gonna do. Uh, and then finally you have uh, tech. It's what we call tech in the business. Okay. Now tech is a more advanced concept. It's basically, given all the things that I'm doing here, what are the things that could go really wrong and how do I prepare for this? So tech, is, is it kind of like a silver bullet in your mind? Where it, it can uh, be, certainly. Um, we'll dive into tech a little bit later in giving some real examples, but tech to me is the thing that I, I look at whenever my deck is losing against something consistently. I think is the fundamental problem, I don't have enough money. It's, if it's not that, okay. Is it that I'm not able to access servers? If it's not that, okay. Then I go down the list and if it's, well, there's just an oddball card, there's an oddball case of something that's just beating me. Sure. How do I defeat that? Well, it could even be as simple as I'm losing because they're killing me right. through damage, right? And so Better that includes some damage. That could be preventing damage. There um, it is. And if that's not really a thing that's happening, maybe that doesn't make it any deck. So the three basics you're saying are economy, breaking ice, and tech. Yes. Those are the three. 
And really concept. with breaking ice to me, it comes with the added tag along of what do you do once it's broken? Yeah. This was actually, we talked about this with Quetzal a long time ago, breaking barrier subroutine is her identity ability. And it's like, oh, this is phenomenal. Uh, however, <laughs> You get in and it's like, okay, I got an access, and then you know, then a new piece of ice is installed and it's kind of over. Yeah. So you need ways to really make the core pay for your being able to get access. The first place we need to start on all of this is how in the world do we evaluate what is a good economy card for me and what is a bad economy card? So I'm gonna introduce some very basic Netrunner math that all of us know and that is done in very different ways. Or maybe don't ways. know. Yeah. It, it, the in, in terms of us who've been playing for five years, yeah, I, I yeah. hope that we have a decent this, understanding of how to do it. This right? is probably the kind of stuff that I have no idea. Okay, well, so there's a very easy me. way to do it. So we're going to pull up two cards here: Armitage Code Busting and Liberated. Account. I feel like this is this is a classic example, right? Classic. This example. is a big discussion. Yes. All right, good. Classic good, example. Move, move. Go on. Okay, so let's just start out. These cards are what I would call active economy. So in order to use the benefit of these cards, you have to use actions to get money off of them, right? Very common, you see this in resources a lot as a runner. So let's take Armitage Code Busting, for instance. The first thing that I wanna do is I wanna see how many credits this card is going to net me overall, sure. right? So starting out, I know that I'm gonna place 12 credits on it, which means that by the end of Armitage Code Busting, I will have gained 12 credits. Yep. And I will have also paid one to install it. Okay. So some very basic so you're up 11. business math. I have netted 11 credits off of this card. <clears throat> okay. But now let's get out our spreadsheet here yeah. because it's not that simple. Because you're also paying something else. This card doesn't just give you money for free. Yeah. Remember that anytime you're taking an action, you could be spending that action to gain a credit directly. Yeah. Right. So every every click of time is at its base value worth a credit. It's at least worth a credit or a card because yeah. you could do that instead of whatever else you're going to do with that action. So first, get my pen out. One, I spend an action to install the card. Yep. I don't have to do that to get credits normally. So that's one, so you install one a card click. And you spend, are you just tracking clicks right now? I'm just tracking clicks. Okay. So I install the card, that's one click. Then I have to use six clicks before this thing is completely cleared off. All right. So, so that's gonna be seven. Seven clicks deep. So seven clicks to get 12 credits, right? So that is kind of the beginning of the basic math. So ultimately, if I subtract this 12 from seven, this five. ultimately nets, nets me five <laughs> But credits. you also have to pay one to install it. I did have to pay one to install it, but I've, and I've accounted for that here, so let's do four credits. Yep. So one to install, then all of the actions that it takes to utilize the card could have been spent getting credits anyway. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, after all of this has resolved, I've done all of this to net four credits advantage. Which is pretty crazy because the like pretty traditional uh, sure gamble mm -hmm. costs five. You have to have five money you five have credits to, have to play. Credits. It, but it's yeah. a single card and a single click, and you gain four credits. And you gain four credits. That's right. But still, you have to account like the click to play the card. Yeah. So then you're minus one. So we'll look at that here in a second. So four credits for Armageddon Code Pressing. Let's look at a similar example: Liberated Account. Okay. Right? So this one is sixteen credits total, and it's six credits to install. So we'll start off with. 10 net. Yep. That's what we get. And then we have one click to install. Then we have four clicks to get all the money off of it. So five clicks total nets us 10 credits, which means that all together, after all of the clicking to get all the money, we get five credits. So, so you'll you're, notice you're net five. It's better than Armitage. Isn't that crazy? In terms of net credits. In terms of net credits. But the other thing to consider is that Liberated Account requires you to have six credits to play it. That is, these are the levers that we're pulling with economy yeah. options. These are the so considerations. There's two main ones. How much is it ultimately netting me? And how much does it cost to get into play? Because a Liberated Account, when I'm at one credit, does not help me at all. Yep. But when I have Armitage Code Busting in one credit, I can accelerate my economy enough to make a difference, have an impact on my, yep. my future turns. Um, the other thing that we need to discuss is often talked about in terms of like compression, like action compression. The important thing here too is that it takes me less time for Liberated Account to get me those five credits. Because like let's presume I first click of a turn, install Liberated Account. Right. So I started the turn with six, six credits. I spent all my money to play Liberated Account. I can spend three clicks. Now I'm at 12. And you get 12. Boom. So in one turn... I went from six to 12 credits. So the speed in which something pays off is also a factor. So those three things really start to you know, tell you which economy is right. Most of the time in Netrunner, there's no just bad economy cards. Like yeah. there's probably a couple that I can think of that are pretty edge case. 
But like just bad economy, they're all just different. You're trading different things for sure. different things. Um, being able to get the money faster, as in real life, is often probably one of the biggest advantages, and that's why a lot of event economy like Sure Gamble is so good, and yeah. a hedge fund like it's so good because it's so fast. Yeah. Uh, but generally, the longer that these take, the more it's going to net you over time. The difference is that Armitage costs so little to install; it's just your basic job. Yeah. That it sacrifices that long-term net gain just from being so cheap. Yeah, right? and it also, you know, in practical terms, there's a lot of times when you know you have a credit to spend, even if you had six credits for a liberated account, spending all of your credits is riskier than spending one of your credits Absolutely. and kind of gaining a little bit less in the, because it's one credit difference at the end, right? Four versus five mm -hmm. net credits. Yeah, it takes a little bit longer, and it's less to install. So these are the things you have to start considering when it comes to economy. Uh, and it's not necessarily about one being bad and one being good, it's more about how is your deck functioning? Uh, and can you get set up with a lot of money early? If so, liberated account gets better. Uh, do you often find yourself on low credits, maybe because you're running a lot of like recurring credits and your runs are super cheap, so you don't need to gain a lot of money? Sure. Then liberated account not as good, maybe as Armitage. And maybe having both in the deck is a great option too. I've done that many times before. Um, so that's active economy. Let's take a look at another example of active economy, mm. which is it's it's act it's the it's just it. Like it's a very special program. Magnum Opus is just the example of how economy can be judged. Really. I, as a, a fan of Kit, uh, which you can see in the, the Kit gameplay video yeah. that I, I played, I love Magnum Opus. I love getting Magnum Opus out early because this is a click for two credits. Mm -hmm. So slightly better than the traditional like click for a credit. You have to spend five. You have to spend five. And it's taking two of your memory. Yeah. But after you've clicked five times to gain two credits, you have broken even, right? Absolutely. So now you're profitable. And a lot of times with this card, I mean, there are games when you're easily using this 20 or 30 times. Let me show, let me show you some math that's going to blow your mind. Oh, my goodness. All right, so we'll do the same thing. We can evaluate this the exact same All way, right? right? Let's do it. Um, so let's start out. We have five credits that we're going to, to install with. We're going to talk about now how that's going to be affected by the actions that it takes to use it. So we've got one action to install it. And then we've got, let's say, five actions to pull 10 off of it, yep. right? So if we pull 10 off of it, then we've netted five credits, and we've used six actions, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So we're still at, really, minus one, because we could have just used minus those actions credit, to get yeah. credits. But then here's the crazy thing. Unlike Armitage or Liberator or anything else, this now, this number, continues to go up forever. Yep. Right? So if you, the next turn, click four times, you're up seven credits. Boom. But you had to spend four clicks. You start to go up. So, so every click, you know, yeah. you're, you're starting to, to see how this goes. You, the reason Magnum Opus is so incredible is that it is literally the end of your need for economy. Yeah. Right? It can just go forever. In particular, if your deck has a way to get Magnum Opus out consistently, you may not even need other economy cards in your deck. Yep. Which it's true. is another, another cost to these cards is that they are taking a, a slot in your hand, a slot in your deck, and so that's kind of like a an un, unspoken cost an assumption. The thing is, like, like if you do click it 30 times, I, I'm not going to do the math real quick, but compare that to something like Armitage or Liberated and the payoff of that single install, it's crazy. I mean, it can net you 20, 30, 40, 50 credits in, in, in a single game. And what all these cards do uh, that is worth just realizing is they are open-handed, on-the-table threats to the, the corp. So at any point with any of these cards, you know, even Liberated, if you have all the money on it, them knowing that three, you can spend three clicks to gain 12 money and then make a run, it's just a reality they have to deal with. Yeah, it's there forever, yeah. and it's really cool. Uh, let's move to a different kind of option, which is passive economy. Okay. Uh, so these are generally cards that are going to give you money over time, and you don't have to invest future actions that into seems, them. seems good. Yeah, so let's compare that. So Daily Cast, for instance, it's going to get us eight minus three net. So that's going to be five credits, ultimately, it's going to get us. And it's going to cost us, how many actions do that? One, one action. One install. So one, one action to install, and then over the next four turns, it's going to pay out two credits at a time. So that's going to net us four credits, just like an Armitage code busting. However, we install it, and we don't touch it. We don't spend nearly as much time. Right. So no more actions are needed. So it's basically you're getting the same payout as Armitage, except faster, and it costs a little bit more to install. So that's why you see a lot of daily casts in decks, is because as compared, if you're going to choose between these two cards, the, really the only reason to choose Armitage is 
A, the kind of adaptability of being able to get four or six credits in a single turn and then do something, sure. or B, the low, low cost of entry. But otherwise, you're getting the same benefit from data cast with no actions. Yeah, which Isn't is that crazy. great. Uh, and then also, similarly to Magnum Opus, we have some infinite sustained economy, uh, something like data folding, right? So it costs you three credits to install, it costs you one action to install, so we're already minus four by, by doing the math there. But then, four turns, we broke an even, it's just going to keep ticking, assuming that and it like stays Opus, on. like it's just going to keep dripping. And then forever. So like, let's say the game goes 20 more turns after I break even. This has gained me 20 credits as compared to a daily cast, which has gained That's me That's a significant four. exchange, yeah. Different, right? So you just have to start to think about all the various ways that you can put money together uh, and then choose, the, choose your favorites, really. I mean, choose the options that are best uh, given the deck that you're, you're trying to build. There are some decks you'll find that maybe they revolve a lot around constant running. They have a lot of effects that trigger off successful runs. They don't have the actions to click an Armitage or a Liberated account very often. Yeah. So they might want to go with passive economy. Whereas if you have a deck that sits back and is very calculated in its runs, it has time to build up with these active economy options and then make the runs, right? So the other thing that I want to show you, Zach, since we're having a little hangout session here, uh, is a couple of events. So first of all, we already talked about Sure Gamble. Yep, classic. So that cost me five. It immediately gains me nine, and it cost me a credit. So that nets me three credits, but it's instant. So yep. the compression on that is super high. Then we have two. These are just brilliant examples. I love these two examples. Uh, the first is Easy Mark, and the second is Career Fair. Okay. Now on the surface, they're essentially doing the same thing. It's an event. It's an immediate. It costs zero. It gains you three credits. So you still have to pay a click to play it, which means that it's netting you two credits ultimately, but it's instant credits. Sure. So it's kind of like clicking an Armitage, just an immediate effect. Right? And the other benefit here is you don't have to have any credits to play these cards. Very, very true. Yeah, so happens. it kind of skips you, skips you up one. But here's the thing, Career Fair also has a discounting effect rather than an immediate gain of those credits. So it's gonna discount three from a resource and Easy Mark is just gonna gain you three. Mm. Now why this is important, and this is another lesson in what would be called compression, is that Career Fair activates. It gives you essentially a three credit benefit, but then you can also imagine it basically removing that action to install off of a liberated account, for instance. Yeah. Right, so if we take liberated account and we remove that initial action that it took to install, it's now netting us six credits, yeah. right? That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. So that means that over time, as we're compressing things down and using things like career fair to get cards out, we're removing that install cost of the card, and so it's actually netting us more credits. So career fair, if you do it on a liberated account, for instance, means four credits ultimately is netted instead of three, like in uh, Easy Mark, or at least gained immediately. So those are the the all of the options that are worth considering. All you gotta know is that you can math this stuff out. You can really look at it and say, what's the better option here? Is it this card or is it that card? Look at how many actions it takes for this thing to pay off. Look at how much it takes to install it. See what the difference in the net credits is and then decide, is a faster payout worth more to me? Is an instant payout worth more to me? Like, how am I gonna balance this? And I think that's why you see the different economy cards showing up in the different decks, because they all treat it slightly differently, right? Um, whereas Kit might rely on Magnum Opus almost exclusively for her economy, criminal runners can't do the same. Because they don't have the tools like Shaper does to go get whatever it is they need. Correct. The other weird thing about economy is there's some bizarre cards. There's just some <laughs> cards that are just conditional, they, you know, who knows how they pay out. Sometimes it's very like Tapworm is a great example mm -hmm. of that. I've actually uh, got you had one it in the stack. Yeah, it's just, and so there's just, you can get creative about this. But the thing that I will tell you, if you're looking for some static advice, some static numbers, if you're capable of kind of mathing out your economy in a reasonable enough way, shoot for about like 50 credits in the deck That's to, to net. So you're basically saying throughout a game you will want you'll want to gain have gain fifty and that plus your your starting five will get you through the average game of Netrunner. If you run a lot, if you run inefficiently, then it won't be enough. Uh, if you make bad decisions, it won't be enough. If you op often aren't playing your economy cards but discarding them, it won't I feel be like enough. that like macro level thinking about Netrunner is something a lot of players don't get to either, and that's important. Where you recognize you know this run cost me eight credits. Mm -hmm. And if my deck is capable of producing roughly 50 credits, 
that's 16% of my available credits for the game. Yeah. And so if that run was not actually worth 16% of my credits, like when you frame it like that, it gets yeah. very different, which is why cards like multi-access become so critical. It's tough. Yeah. And I would tell you this, when you're building a deck and kind of refining it as you go, if you find yourself running out of credits, it's very tempting to say, I need more economy in this deck. Uh, <laughs> and so the I need to be more efficient. <laughs> the reality is most of the time when I've seen new to intermediate players you know, asking these questions, it's why did you make that run that cost 13 credits on the remote that was likely an agenda versus a maker's eye for three on R&D, right? So, so you have Yikes. to also consider <laughs> where are you wasting money? Where yeah. are you making your bets in the incorrect place? So these are all things to, to keep in mind. Uh, all right, moving on to programs, icebreakers. So we need to get through ice. Yep. Very simple math here too. I just wanna pull up two icebreakers, Gordian Blade and Force of Nature. Classic. There are, in the game, icebreakers that are simply better than others. That's, that's the case. There's no... I mean, with, with economy, I feel like there's a lot more give and take because of the timing of things, of the indirect costs, that's of right. the tempo of the game that you want to play versus the tempo of the economy that's in your deck versus the number of economy cards in your deck yeah. because, you know, there's not a cap on how many economy cards you can have in play, really. You could have them all. But you do have a limited amount of memory. Yeah. So... They're all competing with each other, Yeah, basically. and ma by the math books, the math. There's, a, there's objectively... <laughs> the ledger... There's objectively better breakers. And here's the other thing about breakers is it's very much a thematic thing for Netrunner. So Anarchs are good at breaking barriers because think about Anarchs, it's all about busting through things with brute force. Yep. Uh, code down. gates, really good with shapers. Shapers can solve code gates because they're the tinkers, they're the thinkers, they're the artists. They don't have a problem with confusing puzzle type ice. Yep. And then sentries, which are hunting, hunting you down and like doing a lot of damage to you. Criminals have no problem with that. Because they probably, you know, paid it off. They're professionals. They know what they're doing. They know how security systems work, yeah. et cetera. So thematically, the Anarchs are generally going to have your better barrier breakers. Uh, code gates are going to be in the Shapers realm, and then Sentries are going to be in Criminal. Now, the trade-off here is that while there may be a better breaker in another faction, sometimes you don't have the influence to get it. Yeah. Because you want to spend your influence on maybe bringing Magnum Opus in or bringing some other options into your deck. So you have to choose, am I going to use a less efficient breaker that is in faction or a more efficient breaker that I'm pulling in from another faction? Um, so looking at Force of Nature and Gordian Blade, we can see here very quickly that Force of Nature is just worse. <laughs> it costs more to install. Yep, has less strength. Has a lower starting strength. Essentially has the exact same plus one for a credit and then break two subroutines for two credits or Gordian can break two subroutines for two credits or, or one, one for one. one. So it's more adaptable. And it also maintains its strength for the remainder of the run. Gordian Blade, unstoppably better. And you'll than notice, Force of Nature. Gordian Blade costs three influence. Three influence. Force of Nature costs one. Costs one. Uh, hinting already at which one is more, more powerful. That's right. And so Shapers have it, like you said, they will naturally have it easier with Code Gates because they can put Gordian Blade in at no cost. Absolutely. That's, it's going to be in most Shaper decks. And it's great. And uh, that's, that's how they're supposed to function. Versus yeah. the other uh, you know, IDs, if they want to bring Gordian Blade in, they can. But three influence is not cheap. It's not cheap, and you'll often find yourself spending it yeah. uh, on, on a Gordian Blade. Uh, the things to look at in Icebreakers are, one, what's the strength? Two, what's the initial cost to install? Uh, you'll find that in Netrunner, it's a pretty fascinating little thing that happens where there's going to be ice that you don't know about, right? You don't know if it's a code gate, a barrier, a sentry. You know nothing about it. Uh, so do you really want to spend eight on a barrier breaker that might be breaking that next piece of ice? Yeah. Or do you want to spend one on an inefficient barrier breaker that you know can get you through, even though it's not the most efficient But it's going to cost you a lot right? of money. So these are the, the trade-offs. Uh, and then you also have memory. So remember, you start with four MU. And generally, uh, in a traditional runner rig, you have a breaker for code gates, a breaker for barriers, and a breaker for sentries. So that's three MU. So that doesn't leave room for magnum opus. It costs two. It doesn't leave room for two MU breakers, data suckers, viruses, all this kind of stuff. So when you're building your deck, look at how you're going to get through the ice, and then do you need to adjust your MU costs of your breakers down or up based on the free space that you have in the ideal end game? Sure. Um, so there's breakers. There's a couple of different types that you need to know about. You've got your what I would call bendable or pumpable breakers. Uh, get the pump on. That are basically, you can spend credits to increase their strength. Sure. That, that's all that that means. They have the classic. Then there are fixed breakers. Fixed breaker. That are a certain strength that cannot be pumped up via the ability on the card. Via the card itself, yeah. So 
that brings in two different play styles. If you have pumpable, bendable breakers, you're gonna need a stronger economy most of the time because you're gonna need to invest money into them. If you have fixed breakers, you might be investing in things that lower the strength of ice. Uh, ice carver, data sucker, that's the classic Anarch approach, is sure. lower the strength other than raise the breaker up. Um, so those are the options. Then you also have uh, various kind of weird niche types of breakers, like stealth breakers, for instance. They are evolved, or AI breakers. Yeah, or yeah. AI breakers. They Stealth revolves around using what are called stealth credits that are recurring. So they're very efficient to use, but they take a long time to get set up. Yeah. And then you have AI breakers. Now, generally, they can break anything, but they always come some with some cost. bizarro caveats. Some right? We've seen Amakua in the series a lot, the yeah. turtle. Yeah, or um, Crypsis. Crypsis is a classic example. Uh, Darwin, God rest its soul. A <laughs> uh, lot, lot of AI breakers. So there's a number of strategies. For instance, if you have very high impact cards and you need to guarantee that you get access, you might look at an AI breaker that can guarantee that you get access no matter what ice is in front yeah. of you. And you know the AI breakers, because they are so adaptable, can break whatever, they're normally a higher cost, but you can also make runs early you with can. a single AI breaker that you couldn't make if you had to install a Gordian blade and a corroder mm -hmm. and a film. It gets you access way faster, yeah. but it's just more expensive. Uh, so these are the things you have Time to start to balance. Time yeah. and money. Time and money. Uh, and on that note, we have consoles that need to enter the discussion. Now, every runner generally is going to want to bring a console. It's not necessary, but it's hard to find a deck that wouldn't benefit from having one. They bring generally a special ability to your board, and they also provide the much-needed MU. So most consoles provide at least one MU, oftentimes two MU. That opens up your rig to include more cards, uh, more program cards that you can then use to push strategies that you're deciding on. Uh, so various number of consoles in the game all of them have different abilities, and that is one of the most fun things. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys ever played uh, some of these old fighting games, but uh, like Bushido Blade was one of my favorites. And you would choose your character, mm -hmm. which is your ID. So your ID comes with an ability that's going to tell you a little bit how you might want to play. And then you choose their weapon, their sword. You which know, changes how they play. Which changes how they play. Yeah. So uh, look at your ID and your ID ability. Look at all the different consoles you have available. Maybe bring one in from a different faction. So exciting. You can run any console that you want. Spend that influence. And then you get more MU, you get a new ability, and you're off to the races. So there's kind of this interplay between your ID ability, your console, and the programs that you're choosing to include in your deck. That all can change the style of how you're playing. Change the console for a new one. Maybe your programs now change. Maybe your ID needs to swap to a different one. It, it goes a thousand different directions. So check that out, console, ID, and programs, and how they all interact. Just make sure you can get through ICE. That's the main thing. And the basics stay the same, right? Basics stay the same. You, you need a way to get money and cards. And a way to get you, through ice. You need a way to get through ice. Or all get the to ice. servers. Yeah, to get say. into servers. Um, but then once you have money and cards, because that's what allows you to play the things that let you get through ice, mm -hmm. now you have the ability to access. Now we've finally gotten to the part where the deck has got to do something. Now, I mean, yeah, you can check the top part of the deck. Mm -hmm. Classic R and D lock, which we've also seen in the series. Uh, you can also check hand. You can depend on what kind of you know deck you've got. Um, but as important as these concepts is, what do you do once you get there? Yeah, what do you do once you get once, there? Once, once you catch the car, it's like, what's so going on here? Let's take a look. Uh, so similarly on the thematic front, if you look at the three different factions for the runners, Anarchs are really going to kind of focus on archives, but really what that looks like is trashing cards. I was going to say, because the they, they like to trash things, right? Mm -hmm. Top of deck, from the hand, but that puts things into the archives. Yeah, correct. And then we have the Shapers are going to focus on R&D, so they do a lot of messing with the corporation's deck. And then you have the criminals that focus on HQ. And the reasons for this are innumerably cool. But it is think, very cool, if right? If you think about the theme where the criminals are hanging out at HQ, right? They might be invited. And like, they're trying to steal something. They're trying to steal something. They're snabbing some files. They're dressing in you know, uniforms and sneaking in stuff. Uh, whereas the shapers are basically kind of busting into the research and development, the, the lab. The information. Of the, of they're the looking server. for the experiments and the data and the science and yep. all that buried in. And then the Anarchs, of course, are just causing chaos. Yeah, which means trying to destroy things. Trashing cards. And then once it's in the dumpster, they can go pick, pick the things out they want. Absolutely. So let's start off with a classic R&D attack from the shapers. You won't see a more typical multi-access card, <laughs> Maker's Eye. The OG. The OG, Maker's Eye. Uh, so this is simply you access two additional cards in R&D. So if we go back to thinking about icebreakers and economy, if I'm spending 13 credits to get into R&D and I see one card, 
That is way worse than if I'm seeing three cards. I've increased my chances of seeing an agenda dramatically, which means that spending that money is more likely to yield me a reward that is equal to the money that I've spent. Yeah, and right? this is effectively more likely to penalize the corp for allowing you to access. Right. So if I can get in, I may as well see three cards as opposed to one. 100%. Right? Uh, so we also have a great example from the criminals. Similar is legwork. Exact same thing, but it's just focused on HQ. So these are kind of the vanilla, the standard cards that you will see for multi-access options. And now, the, the for the old Anarchs, though, you it's hit archives. You hit archives, you get access to everything. Yeah, So absolutely. their multi-access is just built into the mechanics Yeah, just the get game. everything yeah. in archives and then run. Yeah, how different um, would that game be if it was one at a time? But let's show uh, Bagat. He's a, a common kind of Anarch resource, a good example of what the Anarchs can do. So you run HQ, but by doing so, you force them to trash the top card of R&D. So really, you get to see HQ, you get to access HQ, and yep. then you technically get to access the top card of R&D whenever you're in archives. Because, or you're gonna force the corp to protect their archives. Right, like, which is great. Which is great for you, because they're dividing their- Wouldn't you love to spend their... three servers worth of protection? 100%, so if, if it's not protected though, I mean, it is basically, again, you're putting things in the trash, uncontrollable by the corp, and that, I've seen games that just end. Yep. It's like, oh, there's five points in archives and I just took them. Oops, just got them. Got them. Uh, so multi-access, the most common way to punish a corporation for letting you into their servers. There are a number of other tricks that the runner can pull that are going to, you know, let's say whenever you make a run, you gain money. Or whenever or you, you take money, make a or successful you... run, you steal money. Yeah. All these kinds of effects. But once you have economy and breakers established, the rest of your deck can rotate a thousand different ways. Yep. Uh, if you want to run a really aggressive deck, then look at the aggressive cards that are going to punish the court. Maybe pull some AI breakers and get those early accesses and start trashing cards. If you want to be more uh, in control, look at uh, you know multi-access cards that are aimed at later in the game. Look at various things that uh, give you benefit for making a successful run that are not necessarily tied to early quick aggression, but maybe they cost six credits. And it's but this giant run, thing, but it's right? this big moment, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Just think in terms of this is really what the, the heart and soul of the deck is, is what am I actually going to accomplish with my runner deck? These are the tools I need, economy and breakers, but this is why I'm needing economy and breakers to begin with. And I want the, to do you this. Know, the reason we, we talk about economy and breakers first is obviously without even the special multi-access crazy cards, you can win a game off the fundamentals of... Yep. Money, cards, breakers, accesses. Yep. But again, if you're going to be spending all of this time getting cards and getting getting credits and installing programs to get in, you're really just trying to make it as worth it as possible. And in, in, in doing so, increasing your odds of actually finding something you want. That's generally good game theory, right? Yeah. It's like any additional benefit just from being where you want to be anyway yeah. is worth doing, right? Uh, so then finally, we have a couple of tech uh, examples that I want to bring in. So, so once you have all this laid down. Right, now this could be your, your 45 cards. You know, most runners are a 45 card deck. I suggest that you stick to the minimum amount of cards just because it increases consistency. Uh, and there's a, a huge number of theories on card quantities and whatnot. Uh, but if you want a quick, just kind of general stick assessment, to stick to the minimum 45. I would do, if you're doing all three breaker types, do at least two of each. And if I'm starting out, I would do three of each. So there's nine. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then uh, and then anything else is just kind of run two, yeah. run one, run Us three. Usually, I think this is kind of where we get into tech cards. Um, somewhere between 30 and 40 of your cards will be taken up from programs, economy, consoles, and multi-access. The fundies. It's just like yeah. you got to have them. You need to see them consistently. So you want to run two or three of each breaker and two or three. And that's obviously, again, dependent. Shaper, as an example, has a lot of ways to go find programs. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can get away with running a little less. They can. Um, but even if you have five cards that you can put in at the end, uh, this is where you are making specific choices based on tools that your deck in particular might need because of things it struggles with or things that you think you're gonna see, like corpse, what puzzles are you gonna need to solve and what right. particular responses that aren't generically always good, but in their unique cases are going to be worth having around. Right, so if, for example, uh, you find yourself uh, struggling because all of the agendas that your opponent is running do bad stuff to you. That can be a problem. You know, like that Ob Obukata protocol that I was dealing with with Jinteki for net damage whenever I steal these kinds of things. Uh, Film Critic, great example of a tech card. So Film Critic basically can host a single agenda 
and then you can score it on your own terms on your mm. turn. So when you would you would hit an agenda, you can put it on Film Critic instead. So I have one card. I go and I get a Obicata Protocol. I host it on Film Critic, and then next turn I draw three cards and then score it off of Film Critic, right? Yeah. So if I'm running into a lot of those problems, I feel like my deck's really humming and I'm doing well. But every time I get to the end, I'm I'm hosed because I can't steal the agenda. Film Critic, and a great example of a tech card. And I assume that gets around the like corp cards that can only be played if they scored last turn. Yeah. You Correct. don't technically score it yet, so maybe it. maybe you're not ready. You don't want to get you know burnt. Hunter seeker. Yeah. And it's like I'll, I'll just hold on to this for a minute. Absolutely. Until I am in a position where I want to score it. Another great tech card from the criminals. Do you find that you are getting tagged all of the time, and that's causing all sorts of problems for your resource based economy? Tags well, can be bad. How about a dorm computer? For zero so cost, four power counters, that means you get four runs uh, where you cannot be tagged during the run. What? Isn't that nice? And that's free? And that's free. Where is Avoid this from? Avoid all tags awesome. for the remainder I of the run. I love the theme on that, too. So if you have an opponent who's <laughs> running an MBN deck that is just tagging you seven ways from Sunday and you can't get around it, otherwise your deck's functioning great, but you just keep losing the tags, look at a dorm computer, you know? Like, you can literally make these kinds of very dedicated tech choices. And I think it's it's cool because, like... Netrunner is it has quite a few cards now, and it is full of tech pieces. Just yeah, like you have a lot of fundamentals, but then like there are actually a lot of cards that people write off, they don't think about, and you can you can pant some people. You can definitely sure. pant some people. Uh, and then we've also got if uh, you see a lot of assets, see a lot of trashable cards in the game, and you just can't keep up. You feel like you're so close, but I just keep running out of money because I can't trash all this stuff. Look at something like a scrubber. Right, like two recurring credits to trash cards for the rest of the game. One influence. All these cards are that's, one influence. That's indirectly an economy card. It is. It's one of these great economy cards that only works if your opponent is doing the thing that very they text conditional. For, right. Yeah. But, but that's where you might not run three of those, but you might run one. Might run one. And then run two. If you see it and you're playing against someone who's got a lot of assets installed, or you're seeing a lot of things that you can trash. Welcome to the Pays meta off game, big. my friends. Yeah. Hashtag meta. And then finally, I, it would just be crazy to not mention it. We have uh, something that you'll see probably quite often. If, like in the HB game that we played, uh, you know, you have a lot of these biotic labor plays where somebody's installing an agenda and scoring it out on the exact same turn, then clot is the one of the answers uh, to that. So it simply is a virus. The corp cannot score an agenda on the same turn he or she installed it. Mm. Massive. Impact and big the corp deal. has to purge virus counters to get rid of it. Um, so remember, these are all options that you have available if you find yourself kind of banging your head against <laughs> one like win condition that you just can't yeah. overcome. And you, you can these see how something like Clot, I think, is a great example of a card that is not generically useful because a lot of times corp won't have the capacity to score a the same turn they install it, but there are corps that do. Mm -hmm. And so if you start playing against one of those corps, you put this down, they're going to have to waste a turn. Yeah. Or they're going to have to figure out a new way to score. Yeah, and it's great, and that can really put put a, a damper on the plans. <laughs> a little bit of one, yeah. Um, so on the runner side, this should be an evolving conversation that you're having with yourself, right? When you're you, playing a, and testing. A and deck is not a static. You don't put it together in hiding, in secret, and then bust it out and expect to just rule the world with it, right? That's just not how Netrunner works. You can do that in some more combo-driven card games where you figured something out that is just like busted. Netrunner has so much interaction going on and it's based so much around, quite literally and thematically, the tech that everybody else is running uh, that you have to constantly be evolving to, to overcome those challenges. So, for instance, if all of your opponents are running a lot of tags, probably not the best time to run resource economy like Armitage and Liberated because you get tagged and they can trash it, right? Yeah. If all of them are trying to kill you with damage, then you probably should look at running some prevent damage cards. Um, if all of them are running cheap or little ice, maybe you can get down to one icebreaker. Maybe you go to an AI breaker. And there have been times where that's completely the case. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Or if everything's super high strength, well, look at what icebreakers start out at a higher strength so that you can get through the ice more efficiently. So it's this constant dance that you have to be, be going through, but we'll, we've said it a million times and we'll say it again. The key thing that will win you a game of Netrunner is having enough economy, having the ability to get through ice, and then having the ability to punish the corp for doing both of those things. And right? then making sure you have tools for things that you can't get around. Yeah. Whether it's clot or mm -hmm. 
it, the, those tech pieces can be very important to letting you win games that you otherwise wouldn't have a chance in. That's right. And generally, I think of myself as having about 10 slots in a, any given runner deck that I can customize to my liking. The other 30 to 35 slots fundamentals. are just really devoted to fundamentals because I love fundamentals. So where, where does that leave us with the corp? We've talked a lot about runner here. Right. We uh, have to talk about runner because that sets the groundwork for how we might then talk about the corporation, right? Because now you, as a player, understanding how the runner is approaching the problem of winning the game. Because you're ultimately trying to build a puzzle that they can't solve. You're now trying to figure out how to, given all these things that they're trying to do, still win anyway, right? So the corp advice is a lot less concrete for me. Um, it's, you know, you can evaluate resource and economy cards the same way. How much does it cost to install? How many actions does it cost to use? And how many credits does it get you? Um, but the corp is all about creating a puzzle that cannot be solved by what the runner has put together, right? So that doesn't always mean that you run 16 ice cards. It might mean that you run zero ice. Sure. Right? There, there have been times in the game when runner breakers were really good. Corp ice was not so good. And so it just wasn't worth having ice at all. You stopped running it. You stopped running it, right? Yeah. Maybe instead of running ice, you run cards that are stacked in your deck that hurt the runner. You let them come in, but you give them a, you know, a, a little limitations hey, to running, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you had a snare and you lose cards, you get tagged, and all of a sudden you can't just keep running. That's right. But the main thing when you're starting out with a corp deck, there is one hard and fast rule, and that is based on the number of cards in the deck, Make sure you have the proper agenda spread. <laughs> you want right? to do that, yeah. So that's like, you have to do that or you'll get disqualified. Like, that's necessary. Um, you can find all of that in the rule book and elsewhere. Um, so just look up how many agenda points do I have to have per number of cards in my corp deck. And then whatever that number is, like if it's 44 to 49 is your deck size, then just stick to 49 cards. So it, unlike the runner that you were saying stick to the minimum, the corp you want to stick to the maximum. Maximize your bracket is what we, what we call it from because time to time. Because you're effectively wanting the least number of agendas for the most number of cards Correct. in the deck. And even on the agenda front, I mean, you can run all one-pointers, you can run all three-pointers, That's right. and there's some very different macro-level strategies that are implied from that, right? Yep. It's like if you have a bunch of one-pointers, you may be more okay with them getting in because they're going to have to make so many more runs. And you think about the taxing... Obviously, you might get flooded with agendas, but if you build taxing servers and they're only scoring one point at a time, it's crazy, right? Then, like, they need more than 50 money, and maybe they don't have that in the deck. And let's, let's really just kind of bust this out a little bit. Like, if you imagine that you have a 49 card deck and that puts you at like 20 to 21 agenda points, which I think is it. Yeah. Um, if we put that all in three point agendas, seven that's essentially agendas. seven three point agendas. So, of 49 cards, Seven of those are agendas. So that's one in seven. Which is crazy, right? Yeah. Which means that the runner accessing one card off the top of your deck is very unlikely to be an agenda. But if it is, it's a big deal. Yeah. And then you have to say, well, if I'm running three-point agendas, how am I going to score them? Or you say to yourself, I'm not actually going to score them. I don't even <laughs> care about scoring them. Yeah. So those are the two things that you have to decide is, are you going to win by damage? like the, the non-traditional way, are you gonna take the runner out, kill the runner, whatever yeah. it is, or are you gonna score points? So a traditional corp deck is trying to score points and win the game that way, and then a damage deck is trying to kill the runner, either through net damage, meat damage, or brain damage. Yeah, and if you're going to score the points, how are you going to score them? That's a good question. So there are really two ways to score points in the game. One is hold them in your hand, and then score them out all in a single fast turn. Way. So that they're never in a remote server and they're never exposed, like the uh, Tenon deck that we saw, yep. uh, where it was all central servers. The other way is, again, the kind of more traditional Netrunner style, which is build a remote server that is very taxing, and then put an agenda in it, advance it, and do it in a way that the runner doesn't have a very good option to go steal that agenda, yep. right? Now, there are, if you're going that direction, the other thing you should look at is upgrades that end the run. That's key. This is like number one. So once they get in, they pay all the tax, then they still can't get in. These are called You're defensive like Ash, upgrades. Right. Ash is a great example. Marcus Batty is kind of the key example right now. So Batty is an upgrade that when you flip it up, after the runner's gone through all the nonsense, or even before if you want to really punish him on some ice, uh, you can resolve a subroutine on ice currently in play. Mm. So they go through all this trouble, you still end the run, and then you can score your agenda out next turn. 
So these are called defensive upgrades, and they pretty much guarantee that you can get that agenda safe. That's and fascinating. Secure. Yeah. So if you're playing that traditional score out of the remote game, look at defensive upgrades. If you're playing the fast advanced score out of hand, look at good ice on your central servers and cards like Biotic Labor and Trick of Light and things that will score out agendas, move more than one advancement counter at a time. Um, that's a good way to kind of look at those fast advanced cards. And if you're trying to win on damage, you can do anything. I mean, <laughs> do anything. Like there's yeah. a, include ice that does damage, uh, include a bunch of traps that do damage. Uh, you know, dare the runner to come run this two advanced thing. There are just a number of strategies for the corporation. So the fundamentals are still relatively the same. Economy, so you want to have enough money to res your ice and do what you need to do, advance cards. Uh, you also need to have ice, generally, not always, but generally you want to protect your servers in some way or another. Yep. And even doing damage is protecting your but servers. But that varies wildly based on the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. It's hard and, to even break that out. And then tech. Like, yeah. what's beating uh, you? I was going to say, the other thing on tech and with Corp is that the Corp obviously has a lot of hidden information. Mm -hmm. Whether it's randomly accessing cards from hand or deck, ice that's face down that goes face up. And so, you know, there is the argument of, and when we're looking at icebreakers, you, you have which one is better. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can make that deduction. And then choices based on influence and, and splashing and all that. Totally. But with, uh, you know, a lot of times with the Corp, sometimes the less obvious choices can be better simply because they're not the expected choice. That's correct. It's absolutely like right. Like you can surprise someone with a piece of ice that they didn't think was going to be there or snare in a deck that they aren't expecting snare. It's not a kill deck, so they're comfortable running with two cards. That's correct. And they yeah. just hit it and all of a sudden... Just randomly, yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's fundamentally still a good card. Those surprises are so relevant to corporations. Like, you know, if you're playing the same old Haas and Bioroid deck that is just trying to score out of hand, and everybody expects you to be running these key cards, and then just randomly you have something that does three brain damage, right? It it can just bewilder the runner in such a way that they just they don't know what to do, they can't recover, they weren't prepared for what you were throwing at them. Um, so again, just like the runner, the corp deck should be a constantly evolving thing. Um, as a corp deck gets big, or even in your local group, or if you're just playing with another friend or family member, they'll start putting things in their deck that start to adapt to the ice and the challenges that you're throwing at them, which then means you have the opportunity to adapt to adapt and switch to different ice or different ice types or maybe higher strength ice, no ice at all. Maybe you start focusing on remote servers because they can't trash everything. Sure. And it's this constantly evolving metagame where very much like technology in real life, it it's advances. constant it advancing and adapting uh, to new circumstances. Um, so that's really the, if I could give a, you know, a, a long-winded bit of advice to a new player, hopefully a newer intermediate player who's watching this, those are the things that I've learned as a player. Um, I'm not a particularly great deck builder, especially on the corp side, uh, but those are really the things that you just have to know and that you should be considering whenever you're building these decks. And the, the thing that I'll leave you with that has always been fascinating to me is the idea of being credit perfect. And so this is the theory basically, and there are certainly some caveats in terms of threatening certain positions, but if you end the game with more than zero credits, you wasted actions, right? It's like if you're the runner and you hit that last point and you have 16 credits in your pool, hmm. you didn't need the 16 credits. You waste a lot of cards in time. You waste a lot of cards in time. Yeah. If you're the corporation and you have 23 credits whenever you win the game, Probably wasted a lot of time. Yeah. Now, the corp is a little bit different because you have to have enough credits to potentially res various pieces of ice yeah. if the runner is going to make that play. Well, and there's obviously there's the idea to foil that a little bit uh, that you know me showing a certain amount of credits mm -hmm. forces you into different decision making. Certainly. Uh, so I might, as the runner, end with ten credits, but had I not had that showing, you would have chosen a different path. Yeah. Um, but it is still worth considering, right? And I think going back to something you said earlier that I think is so important in any game, but particularly in Netrunner, which is uh, on the economy feeling like, I don't have enough money, so I'm going to put more money cards in, and not ever asking the question, or could I be doing it, the things I'm doing more efficiently? More efficiently. I think that is so critical, both as Corp and Runner. Ending with credits, that, that is pointing at potential waste. Yeah, uh, and then asking the question: Really, what's worth it, and not as far as resing, spending credits on? That's key. Spending credits on, like I've seen people spend ten money on a run that is irrelevant. 
pretty much irrelevant. And I've seen somebody res a 12 cost piece of ice to keep the runner out of trash. Yeah. Right? So really, you don't have to res ice. You don't have to end runs. You don't, like, just look at it in terms of risk, reward, and, you know, make your bets. Put the chips on the table. That's really what it's about. So thank you guys so much for, for watching all of this. We hope you've enjoyed all of the uh, Learning Netrunner series. We might add some more videos or uh, topics to this as we go along. But again, you can find all of these uh, various videos and blogs where we kind of outline further some of the stuff we've been talking here on, on the videos. Uh, all of that's on our website. You can check links to that uh, below in the description or elsewhere where we'll try to get them in front of you either right after this video ends or right now in a pop-up or somewhere. Who knows? We'll, we'll put them somewhere. Uh, but hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, a lot of advice. And until next time, keep playing. If you want more of these kinds of videos, you can check the rest of our Learning Netrunner series. You can also click over to our blog via the description in this video to find deck lists for everything used here as well as more detailed information. We've also got revised course sets on the store, data tokens, and our subscription service to send you every product as it comes out. Thanks for watching.